Good morning, church. Great to see you. Happy Father's Day, gentlemen. Happy for you. I got a card from one of our sons uh, this week, and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you, and then you open it up, and it says, but we all, we all know Mom did all the work. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's what she did. Yeah, she laughed. Today we want to talk about love rejoices with the truth. That phrase there in 1 Corinthians 13, someone said, Pastor, why do we keep using the same reference of Scripture every week, every week? 1 Corinthians 13. I said, we're going to use it until we get it right. I mean, come on. And the Bible, you know, the Bible is a kind of book because of the inspiration of God's presence and spirit on it. Really, every time you read the Bible, it's a new experience, right? It's like the first time, and God reveals new things. And I trust that you are finding renewal in this uh, passage. I certainly am. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. We're going to project the words on the screen. We want to hear these words and be inspired by them. So as you're able, would you please stand to hear God's word? The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth, And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. God inspires today through these words. You may be seated. A few years ago, an article was written based on a survey. The article was entitled, Truth or Consequences? Is America Telling the Truth? Now this article concluded from the survey that 20% said that making enough money was justification to lie. 25% believed it was okay to lie to make yourself look better. 30% said they had lied on their job application. 46% of respondents said they knew a friend who had cheated on their spouse. 51% said people are not as honest as they were 10 years ago. Can I get a witness? <laughs> That's probably true of every generation to make that assumption. 60% said it was okay to lie to save yourself from embarrassment. The documentation does suggest a significant level of dishonesty in our culture. Now, listen, before you settle into your nap this morning, <laughs> let me appeal to you. Let me just invite you, ask you to consider this important subject, that telling the truth and living in the truth is centrally important to authentic, intimate relationships. Without it, you can't have trust, and without trust, you can't have intimacy. So honesty and truth-telling and truth-living is very critically important. So if you will, before you doze off, stay with me as long as you can, just for a few, few minutes. The survey went on to ask, to whom do you regularly lie? If you are lying, who are you lying to? 86% say they lie to their parents. 75% say they regularly lie to their friends. 61% said they lie to their boss. 59% say they lie to their children. 73% said they lie to their siblings, and 79% say they lie to their spouse or their lover. Now, if these numbers are even close to accurate, it's no wonder we have fragmenting relationships, and we all know why. We know this instinctively. We know this intuitively, that truth-telling is absolutely essential 
as a foundation for authentic relationship. And without it, it's impossible to have the trust you need for that level of relationship. Our text then today, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, it says, Love rejoices in the truth. Love has a joyful party in the truth. Love loves the truth. Love just loves the truth. So important. Ephesians 4.15 says, let, let our lives lovingly express the truth in all things. Follow this thought. All things, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly. So simply speaking the truth is not the whole story. The scriptures teach us the importance of dealing in the truth with our words, with our actions, with our motives, with all of our relationships. It's a holistic thing to be truthful. Dishonesty destroys relationships, while honesty is one of the foundation stones of great relationships. I think, I think we believe that. So let's consider, how can we learn honesty, and what are some ways we can accomplish this important lifestyle? Here's number one. Tell the truth consistently. Tell the truth consistently. What if your husband came home and said, Honey, I just want you to know I'm committed to telling you the absolute truth six days a week. Or I'm committed to telling you the absolute truth 14 hours per day. Or your child comes home and says, Mom, you can count on me 75% of the time. I'm going to be truthful. I mean, that dog won't hunt. It's just not going to work. Have you ever heard this phrase, forgiveness is given, but trust is earned? You've heard that, haven't you? That's actually true, isn't it? Forgiveness is given, trust is earned. That trust is something that has to be accumulative. You've got to demonstrate a consistent truth-telling in order for there to be a foundation of trust, indeed. The survey indicated the number one need that people express in relationships is the need for honesty. Proverbs 13, 17, reliable communication permits progress. Proverbs 11, 3, people who cannot be trusted are destroyed by their own dishonesty. Have you ever known someone who was chronically dishonest? If you can recall such a person, re rehearse their relationships, their primary relationships. Were they strong or were they weak? Hard to have good relationships when you're a liar. Proverbs 12, 19, truth stands the test of time, but lies are soon exposed. Indeed, lies will find you out in a relationship. If you can't be honest, then you can't be intimate. What about the business life? What about your, your business world? Are you reliably truthful in that context as well? I hope you are. I uh, read this uh, top 10 great American business lies recently. Maybe you can resonate. Number 10, business lives. Number 10, the check is in the mail. Number nine, your money will be cheerfully refunded. Number eight, give me your number and the doctor will call you right back. Uh huh. Number seven, your table will be ready in five minutes. Okay. Number six, this offer is limited to the first 100 callers. Right. Number five, we service what we sell. Okay. Number four, one size fits all. Now we know that's not true. Number three, open wide, it won't hurt a bit. Mm -hmm. Number two, this used car is in mint condition. And the number one great American business lies is, I'm from the IRS and I'm here to help you. <laughs> if the IRS or the Social Security <laughs> System Administration knocks on your door, it's not good news. It's not good news. I, I began to look at it, surveys of professions. And the reason I had to look at more than one is I was trying to find the one that answered the question properly. <laughs> Which profess professions do you trust the most? And I, I had to sort through a bunch of them until I finally found one that made preachers the number one trustworthy profession. <laughs> it took a while, but I found one. So a survey of professionals said, <laughs> Which professions do you trust the most? Number one was pastors. Which do you think came in last? It is not lawyers. It's advertisers. Survey said only 10% believed you could trust what the advertisers say. Second from the bottom, auto mechanics. Now listen, if, you know, if you're in these professions, I'm not trying to impugn your profession. I didn't write the survey. I didn't take the survey. All, all we learn from this is that perhaps uh, as a Christian person in these kinds of professions, you've got to work doubly hard to engender the trust you need with the people you serve. Third from the bottom is your lawyers. 35% said they trusted TV news reporters that still rank below fictional TV characters. 
I play a doctor on TV. You can trust me. And apparently people do. Trust those folks more than they do <laughs> news reporters. Doctors rank 3% higher than politicians, with 63% of the population trusting them. The point is that we're really not trusting each other because we're not telling the truth enough to one another. So tell the truth consistently. Here's the second thought. Tell the truth completely. Tell it completely. We have to be straightforward, forthright with our communication. Proverbs 10.10 10 says, someone who holds back the truth causes trouble. So in relationships, the trouble caused by dishonesty is the curse of superficiality. We can't go to the levels that God calls us to in our important relationships with spouse or children or close friends unless we have honesty. Proverbs 28, 23, in the end, people appreciate frankness rather than flattery. Perhaps you've been around folks who are good at flattery, not so good at the truth. Proverbs 28, 23, in the end, people appreciate frankness rather than flattery. The, God created us with a need for these intimate relationships, and so it's important. Proverbs 24, 26, an honest answer is a good sign of a good friendship. It is. Now, remember, this is not a license to be rude. We talked about this a few weeks ago. You can be right, but if you are rude, then you're wrong. Truth-telling often requires tact and great carefulness. It really does. Very important. Look at this uh, statement on the screen. We need to tell the truth consistently so that we can be trusted. We need to tell the truth completely so that our relationships can go beyond superficiality. Indeed. My mind first goes to marriage, then to other relationships. Does truth help in a marriage? <laughs> Come on. Both telling the truth and hearing the truth lays a foundation for a great relationship. Have you ever heard a husband and wife say about the other, he's my best friend, she's my best friend? There's a lot implied there. It's a good thing. It's a good statement. It means that I can rely on this other person to be forthright and honest and truthful with me. That's a good thing. So tell the truth completely. Now here's a third thing. Tell the truth lovingly. Boy, if you're still awake, this one's important. <laughs> Ephesians 4.15. Ephesians 4.15 says, Speak the truth in a spirit of love. How you tell the truth... How you do it is vitally important. Your motive behind the truth you're telling is essential. Um, now, from a very positive point of view, think of a person you would like to help change. Please don't look to the right or your left. Just keep, keep, <laughs> keep looking forward. Here are a few tips on how you can do this well. The person you wish to help will respond much better to the truth spoken in love than in any other way. Truth without love is frequently rejected. Hear that again. Truth without love is rejected, even though it's the truth. Truth, truth is intrinsically good, but if it's presented in the wrong spirit, then it can actually do harm. Maybe the greatest example of this is in presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, it's just been astonishing to me that the gospel means, literally means, good news. So the gospel's good news. Well, what's good about it? Well, when you talk to some people, you wonder if it's good at all because somehow it always comes out bad and it's angry and it's mean and it's judgmental and it's harsh and it's, and it's all about how bad I am. And friends, that's not what makes the gospel good. Now, you've got you to factor that sin thing in there, but the other side of the gospel and the, the glorious part of the gospel is the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, the unearned favor of God, the un the, the undeserved favor and love of God extended to you. God saw us when we were hopeless, knew that we couldn't dig out of the hole that we were in, and he dug us out on our behalf because he loved us. And all we need to do is accept this wonderful gift of God's accepting love by faith. That's good news. That is good news. When, when, God, when God looks at us, he's not ever going to say, what have you done for me lately? It's not about what we do. It's what he has already done on our behalf. That's good news. That's the gospel. And yet we can make the gospel turn sour by emphasizing the wrong parts of it. Jesus was and is the truth. And he always presented truth in a package that people could receive. His motive was always for the benefit of the other person. And even when he was direct, direct in his communication, even provocative in his communication, confrontational, Folks at least had a moment when they 
considered the message because the messenger was motivated rightly from a spirit of love. Ephesians 4.29, look at it on the screen with me. Speak only what is helpful in building others up according to their need that it may benefit those who listen. This is how I check myself when I'm imagining myself as a truth teller. Am I speaking this truth for my benefit or am I speaking it for their benefit? This, this is how I check my motive. Am I doing this for me or am I doing it for them? And if my motive is for them, then my motive is right. And when I speak truth to them with them and their best interest in mind, that's the best context in which they are likely to hear it. Very important. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe the devil can tell the truth? And it's not a trick question. It's Actually, the devil, sure, he can tell the truth. But what we know about the devil is there's, there's no truth in him. He's a liar and the father of lies. He is corrupt in every way. And yet, is it possible for him to tell the truth? Of course, he can tell the truth. For example, he may say to me, he may say, you know, you, that was a pitiful effort. I mean, you really could have done better there. You know, you know good thing. Now, is that the truth? Yes. Okay. That one time, it, that's the truth. But what is his motive? Is his motive for my best interest? Is he trying to bring good into my life? Of course not. So his motive is always to steal and kill and destroy and knock us off our place and try to discourage us and embarrass us, and that's his motive. But the devil can tell the truth. The same is true with a gossip. A gossip can tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth all the time and still be gossiping. Remember, gossip is when you're not part of the problem or part of the solution, but you keep talking about it anyway. You're not involved. It's not about you. It didn't start with you and it won't end with you, but you're yapping about it anyway. That's gossip. It's a bad thing. It divides people. It breaks relationships. That's why the Bible is pretty clear about gossip. It's one of those bad deals. So you can tell, you can tell the absolute... A gossip doesn't have to be a... Uh, an untruth or a half-truth in order for it to be gossip. Uh, so you understand motive then becomes central to our truth-telling. It has to be in love. Here's number four. Tell the truth tactfully. Now this is kind of the first cousin to lovingly, but it's very important. Remember, tact is making a point without making an enemy. Tact is thinking something without always saying it. Have you ever known someone who didn't have any impulse control? There was no filter if it came into their head, it immediately went out of their mouth. You ever been around someone like that? Listen, if you're a person who tends to do that, you've got to work on that. Because it's, it's like a bad thing to say the wrong thing at the wrong time in front of the wrong people. You can't just blurt out everything you know all the time. Everything you think all the time. There's context. And that's called tact. And so the truth needs to be told tactfully so that you measure the circumstances, measure the culture, the environment, the moment, and then you try to measure your words carefully in that context. Yeah, you, don't, you don't have to tell everything you know about every subject in front of every person you meet. You have to be tactful. Tact is being able to change the subject without changing your mind. Occasionally, there'll be situations when you don't want to speak the truth, and the other person doesn't want to hear the truth. Ever been in that moment? Years ago, I had a good friend. Uh, we played softball together, and, you know, we were neighbors and buddies and years ago. And I found out he was having an adulterous affair. And I found out about it, and I knew it was true. And I started going through the potential list of people who ought to talk to him about that. And the list came down to one, and it was me. Now, look, that, that's a conversation you don't want to have, right? I mean, who wants to do that? But I, after prayer and thought and consideration, I realized I was the guy, I was the appointed guy because someone needs to tell that guy the truth. And it has to be done tactfully and it has to be done lovingly. And so I set him down in the right moment privately and I said, I know what you're doing. And I said, you have to stop in Jesus' name. You have to, you have to preserve your marriage and protect your wife. You have to preserve your children and their best interest, you can no longer live in a selfish way. You have to stop this, and you have to stop it right now. 
I don't know what your excuse is. I don't know what your rationalization is. And right now, I don't care. If you need help with that, I'll help you. But today, the decision has to be made. You've got to stop it. And right now. And he did. And that death spiral he was in with his family, he pulled out of. He had a good friend who was willing to say the truth in a tactful way. If you walk up to someone, someone you love very much, and they're not, they're not taking care of themselves physically, and you're, you're afraid of them for their lives, you know, there's one way to say that, and there's another way to say it. I mean, if you walk up to someone and, you know, you're a fat slob, slob you're going to die early, no one cares. That's going to be hard to hear. If instead you say, you know, God has a great plan and purpose for your life, and he has, he has all this potential for you in the future, and I want you to live out all the days that God designed for you, and if you don't take care, better care of yourself, you're going to die before your time. And so as your friend, as someone who cares about you, I, I insist that you change your lifestyle so that your numbers get lower and you get healthier so that you can be better as God's put his hand on your life. There's a way to be tactful about that, and it's important that you use the tact. This is the arena of sensitivity, the ability to tell the truth and make a point without making an enemy. Look at Proverbs 12, 18. It says, thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. Do you see the contrast there? We all have a choice in truth-telling. The choice is to heal or the choice is to hurt. It's up to you. Well, and when you're in that situation, can I get, just give you... Right now, as I told that story about my friend who was having the affair, there are people in the room, I know this is true, there are people in the room, you're going, oh, geez, I know somebody I need to talk to. Oh, man, I've been waiting and waiting, hoping someone would do it. And it looks like it may be falling to me. Darn it, pastor. I, I, know, I know the internal speak. I get that. If you're, if you're called of God to do this kind of confrontation, here's a couple of ideas for you. Number one, plan your presentation. By that, I mean think about it. Pray about it. Prepare your words. Rehearse the speech. Say the words out loud so you can hear them, or maybe with your spouse. These are the things I'm going to say. Does it sound right? Does it sound loving? Does it sound tactful? Uh, and, and work on your speech. Proverbs 16, 23 says, intelligent people think before they speak. They think about it. Then what they say is more persuasive. Uh, I read a book, many of you have read it, by Gary Smalley, entitled The Language of Love. I recommend it to you. It's just a great roadmap on how to, how to be truthful and loving at the same time. Gary Smalley, The Language of Love. It's still in print. You can grab one. So plan your presentation. Then second of all, choose the right time. And by that, the right setting, the right environment for that kind of conversation. I mean, there's a right place and there's a wrong place. There's a right time and a wrong time. You know, kind of a, an extreme illustration in my world is... Uh, Two minutes before a worship service is about be to begin and someone walks up and this happens from time to time. Pastor, could I speak with you? Just take a second. Okay, sure. Who's going to say no to that? And in the next 30 seconds, it's uh, my marriage is in trouble. I just lost my job. The, my kid wrecked the car and, I, you know, I, and my, my dog died and, and, and two of my children are strange I don't know, and in tears. What am I going to do? You know, in 90 seconds till I'm supposed to stand up and say something meaningful to people. That's like the wrong time. What am I supposed to say to that? <laughs> There's a right place. Here's the formula. Truth plus tact plus timing equals good communication. Truth plus tact plus timing equals good communication. And that equals good re relationships. Ecclesiastes 8.6 says, There's a right time and a right way for everything. Okay, there's the sermon. Those are all my points. It's a summer sermon, short. Oh, now you're back awake. Great. Well, welcome back. It's nice to, <laughs> nice to see you. So what's the point? Why bother with all of this? Why does it matter? Why go into this, this subject matter? Well, it's because of the incredible results that truth-telling will bring to your life and relationships. Listen to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. It says, if we walk in the light, listen, if we, if we walk in the light, it says we have fellowship with God. How awesome is that? 
fellowship with God. A relationship with God, Almighty God, is possible if we walk in the light of truth. Something that you may not be sensitive to is in the worldview of most people in the world, they don't believe that a relationship with God is possible. For example, there are a billion Muslims on the earth right now. They, they follow the teachings of Muhammad. And in their worldview about God and relationship, this is how it all sorts out. A relationship with God is not possible in Islam. God is great. God is powerful, all-powerful. He is to be esteemed. Allah is to be worshipped. And Allah is to be served. But he cannot be known. You can't be in a relationship with God. That's not possible. He's too great and you are too small. There's no connection with God relationally. You recognize his greatness and you live your life in service to his greatness, but don't expect to relate to God. This comes into, into stark contrast when you're in a Muslim country. Many times in Kazakhstan, for example, where we have all these initiatives, and I've been in country, and, and the oldest person at a dinner party is asked to give a blessing at the end of the meal. And many times that's fallen to me. Would you bless us as we leave? Sure, I'll give a blessing. I assume the Muslim posture. And I say, oh God, we thank you for this wonderful home. We pray for your blessing. And there's a, there's, there's a protocol there, an expectation of blessing. Bless this house and, and, and bless uh, this work and bless, bless uh, these people. But I always then take it down another notch and I say, and bless my friend and I call them by name. Bless my friend and bless his wife and bless these children and bless the work of their hands and bless their hearts and their relationship with one another and in their relationship with you. And thank you for this, the richness of this friendship, which is a gift of God, the intimacy we enjoy with one another. Thank you, God, for this favor and your blessing. And this always causes Kazakhs, who are traditionally Muslim, to go like this. And there have been occasions when, when after that kind of prayer, they will inquire, who were you talking to? I was talking to God. How, why would you talk to God like you know him? Because I do. You understand, God is knowable. We are followers of Jesus, and what God did, as great and as awesome and as mighty as he is and unapproachable as Almighty God is, he lowered himself all the way to put on an earth suit and become a man. His name was Jesus Christ, and the Bible says that if you've seen him, Jesus, you've seen the Father. This is a mystery once hidden, now revealed, which is the hope of glory to us, that God now is a knowable God because of the person of Jesus Christ. And the whole purpose of your existence, the reason God made you wasn't just to serve him. The whole reason God made you is to know him and to have intimacy with God. This is what God wants from you and God wants for you. This is a wonderful thing. And if you walk in the light... You have the fellowship with God. Jesus said, I am the truth. So if you walk in relationship with Jesus, who is ultimate truth, you have fellowship, intimacy with God. What an awesome gift. What an amazing privilege. And not only does that carry over in our relationship with God, but this carries over in our relationship with one another. If we walk in the light of the truth, then we have intimacy with one another. Wow, that's such a great thing. And so the model that we have in our relationship with God through Jesus Christ is the one we are to have with one another. You know, for example, in marriage, then we don't want to rock the boat. Things are pretty good. There are issues we should face into, but it's easier not to. The problem with that, when you're not walking in the light with one another, is that when major challenges come through, circumstances or hardship or tragedy, then your relationship won't be strong enough to endure. And, and families unravel because we wouldn't walk in the light and deal with the issues that, that keep us from the level of intimacy that required in a covenant relationship, in a marriage or a friendship or in a family. You know, divorce court produces truth. One of the things that just befuddles me is how truthful people become at the point of divorce. Just a few weeks ago, I was personally in a divorce court as a character witness in a custody battle. I mean, ease. 
And you get in divorce court and people are as forthright as you can imagine. Airing all this dirty laundry about one another and themselves. And my question is, why not get to the truth before you get to that moment? Why not be truthful and deal with the issues before you get to divorce court? That's wonder. Determined to tell the truth in a loving and tactful manner. There, in, my, in my world view, uh, another issue that comes up that is applicable here is why there's a subculture of Christians who jump from church to church. And I actually understand it. It's because people would rather change location than face the truth and work out their relational issues with integrity. Dozens of times now over the last several years, I meet people who are formerly part of our church, and they'll say, you know, the people in our new church are so friendly and responsive. And every time, if you say this to me in the future, you'll get this response, so just be ready for it. Every time I say, no, they're not. The people in your new church are just like people in your old church. Your new pastor is just like your old pastor. He's got stinky, stinky feet, just like me. And there's no difference. Just because you've changed location doesn't mean it's changed you. Changing locations won't change you. Only the truth will change you. <laughs> it's so quiet. Now, I'm not saying God won't call you out of one church and into another church. In fact, God does that all the time, and, and I recognize that. And when that happens, you, you will have my blessing, absolutely. And you might push back with me and say, okay, pastor, you, you're, you're picking on us. What about you preachers? Because I've been in places where pastors, you know, are there about three or four years, and then they check out. What is that about? Same, it's the same issue. They don't want to face the truth about their own fears and their own pain and their own weaknesses in, in, in leadership. See, relationships get strained in the church, and it's easier to run rather than cope with the issues. How many times do you think in 30 years I've been tempted to run? Many times. And each time I've had to make a decision, like I can either run away from this or I can face into this. And what I've chosen to do, you know, when you've led the same organization for 30 years, all the problems in the organization is pretty much your fault. <laughs> What's the matter with this church? I don't know. I'm, I'm uh, you know, it's my fault. <laughs> if I'd only been here three months, then I just go, I blame the last guy. Well, the last guy didn't, I, don't worry, I'm your man. I'm, you know, I, I'm Superman. I'm Mr. Clean. We'll have this all cleaned up here anytime soon. So what happens is I have to decide Either I can run, I can change location, or I can face into the issues and try to grow and learn from it and start over. Um, this has happened to me many, many times. I've written resignation letters many times over the years. Um, never have submitted one, but I've written them. And what I have to do is I have to start over. And I figure, okay, I'm going to start over. I have to start over. So where do I want to do that? I can go somewhere else and start over or just stay here and start over. And I said, well, I already got the house. So I'll just stay here and start over. And that's, so I've done that many times. I think that's a better way. I wonder, why is divorce so commonplace? I'm 57 years old, so I'm a, I'm a really old geezer. When I was in grade school, you know, going through first through sixth grade, we had about 20, 20 students in my little class. And as I recall, we had two students in my class who were from broken homes. Forty years ago, 50 years ago, it was very uncommon for any, anyone to experience divorce. Very unusual. Today, no matter what culture you're in, what neighborhood you're in, what school you're in, private or public, it's hard for you to go into any classroom and not find about half or more of the students from broken homes. Divorce has become commonplace. It's become acceptable. You see, 40 years ago, there was a stigma on divorce. You just didn't do that. There was a value in the culture that said marriage is a covenantal relationship and you, and you make it work. And I'm not saying that making a marriage work is always the best option every time, but what I'm saying is that figuring out how to make it work in a loving, tactful way is better than breaking your breaking your family. It's amazing to me how many folks will reach for divorce first rather than dealing with their issues and dealing with their pain and dealing with their wounds and they're willing to take themselves and their children through hell 
because it's just easier to do that, it seems, than to stick it out. My point is simply this. You can change your wardrobe, you can change your car, you can change your home, but it won't change you. You can change locations, but it won't change you. You can change jobs. People do this. We get resumes here at Union Chapel all the time. People have been in five different jobs in the last eight years. What's going on? That's just a flag for me. That's not, that's not good. That's not healthy. You can change jobs, but it won't change you. You can change spouses, but it won't change you. You can change churches, but it won't change you. I promise you it won't. Here's the truth. The truth is that truth is the most liberating, transforming force in the world. Believing the truth, submitting to the truth, applying the truth to your life will change you. It's the only thing that will change and transform your life. If you will believe the truth and submit to the truth, that's a whole other subject, another series of messages, but submit and apply the truth to your life. Applying this message to your life will make a difference. Make a commitment to live as a truth teller because love rejoices, understandably, rejoices with the truth. Finally, Jesus said it this way. He said, you will know the truth and the truth will Did you get it? I hope so. Stand with me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word, which lamps our feet and lights our way, prepares the way for us. Lord, as men and women now, having heard these words, help us to allow them to take root into our hearts. Help us, God, to determine lovingly, tactfully, to walk in the light of truth, to be truth tellers and truth livers so that we might be changed, transformed. And Lord, in those occasions when you ask us to speak the truth into other people's lives, Lord, help us to be tactful, motivated by love. God, this is what changes people. This is what, this is what helps transformation occur when we live in the light, walk in this truth. So Lord, we pray that you would give us the grace we need to honor these wonderful values. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And everyone said, amen.